Hello, this is Aaron, and once again, welcome back to the podcast. And again this week, I'm doing this live. So I will probably continue to do the podcast live until I screw up really bad ones, and then I'll go back to recording it. But for now, we're going to keep with it because it did help with video stability. Uh, and keep sending feedback on that. If you see any video problems, uh, let me know. My three worlds framework for understanding evangelicalism, Christianity in the modern age, what I call the positive, the neutral, and the negative worlds, continues to drive a ton of discussion. It's just going bigger and bigger, which is incredibly gratifying. And if you're listening to this going, well, what the heck is this framework? I will throw a link in the show notes to my First Things article called The Three Worlds of Evangelicalism. I'm not going to go into it here but it's really gratifying to see that something you created provokes so much discussion out there in the world. It's great. I got a couple of these going. As I said, my Indiana discussions uh, are also kicking up a lot of discussion. When it comes to the positive, neutral, negative world, not everybody buys into the framework. So some people are disagreeing with it, but that's okay because disagreement is still engagement. Uh, it's been said the opposite of love isn't hate. The opposite of love is indifference. And so when people are even disagreeing with you, it's actually still engaging with you, which is great. And a lot of times we can actually learn a lot from the people who disagree with us. Sometimes even the people who really hate you and just rag on you can tell you things that are very important and give you information that may be unpleasant to see, are here, but is very useful anyway. But even the more respectful critics often can give you really great information, news you can use, as I like to say. Let me give you an example. Uh, there's a guy out there, Samuel D. James, who wrote a letter to the editor of First Things magazine, uh, taking issue with some of my articles. Now, I've known, I don't know Sam personally, but I've followed him for many years. And Sam disagrees with me on a number of points. But you know what? That's okay. I like him. And my measure of whether someone's basically a good guy is not whether or not they agree with me. In fact, he wrote an article for First Things. I think it was called The Lost Boys. That was one of the original inspiration pieces for me starting my masculinist newsletter back in the day. And in this First Things response to my article, he's like, hey, you really should be looking at H. Richard Niebuhr's framework. Uh, from Christ and culture. So H. Richard Niebuhr wrote this book probably about 70 years ago where he talked about the different ways that Christians can respond to culture. You can fight culture, you can withdraw from culture, you can assimilate to the culture. There's four or five different ones. And you know what? That's really a great framework to anchor back to because I don't want to give the impression that I think these culture war people invented the very idea of fighting with the culture. No, I mean, they were drawing on themes that had been around for a long time. So at different points in time, different ones of these themes or response patterns comes to the fore. And so it would be good if I were able to write an expanded version of my Three Worlds thesis to more engage specifically with uh, Niebuhr and with other people. I've actually been collecting various frameworks and different other observations about the world so that I can anchor mine in what a lot of other people are doing or how it differs or, or is similar to it. So when people say things like this, it's actually often very good stuff. You can say, yeah, even though this guy doesn't really agree with where I'm coming from, there's a lot we can learn. We can actually improve what we're doing. It's interesting to see who likes and doesn't like the framework. The people who have given me the biggest positive feedback, interestingly, are the seeker sensitives. That group I said were kind of a positive world group that represent essentially non-denominational megachurches who in many ways are the evangelical mainstream, if you want to call them that. Now, of course, a lot of them have never read it, never heard of it. That's a huge group, but I've gotten the most positive feedback from them, and most of the feedback that I've gotten from that group is positive. So it's like, wow, I've seen all this stuff out there in the world. I've tried to make sense of the world. You just helped me really understand all the stuff that's been out there, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it. 
So that's great. The culture war people, by and large, I've heard very, very little from. Let's be honest, they don't read magazines like First Things. They tend to be listening to Sean Hannity or something like that. So this is a group of people that uh, really probably has had less exposure to what I'm talking about, and I haven't gotten uh, much from them at all. Uh, I think to some extent they would resonate with the idea of a negative world because that's sort of their, their mindset towards culture is very negative. But I'm a little bit down on this idea of fighting uh, in the way that they do. This idea that we're going to take back the country, we're just going to fight like the moral majority fought. That sort of mentality, I think, is a little bit obsolete. Things need to be different today. The cultural engagement people is where I've gotten the most engagement. Again, those are the people who, by and large, read magazines like First Things. You know, who reads 4,500-word magazine articles? Uh, that's that's those people. And this is where I've gotten, you know, by far the most negative uh, take on it. Now, I will say quite a few neutral world people are positive on it, but quite a bit of negative uh, as well. And it's not uh, hard to see why, because in essence, I sort of, rain on their parade a little bit by saying that I think that this model is sort of becoming obsolete uh, in terms of being effective um, for mission. And so what I always say to people, if they don't find what I'm doing of value, if they don't like it, don't use it. The beauty of consulting type models like this one is that they're very different from a theological scientific or philosophical proposition. If I'm making a theological claim or a scientific claim, I'm saying this is what's true about the world in some sort of an objective sense. Whereas these consulting frameworks exist for utilitarian purposes. They're tools. They're here to help you make sense out of the world and respond to it. And there's a bunch of these things. There's the Porter's Five Forces model. Uh, which was created by Michael Porter up at Harvard Business School. There's SWOT analysis. You probably don't think of that as a framework, but it is. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. This is probably a, a framework that you've used. If you've used anything, you've probably used that one. There's the Boston Consulting Group Matrix. There's the Gartner Magic Quadrant Diagram. There's a million of these. Those are just some of the more famous ones. And some of them people really resonate with. They help them really think about the world. Others, they don't. So SWOT really never resonated with me. I've tried doing it and I sometimes have trouble distinguishing between a weakness and a threat. And it just never was something that, that hugely resonated with me. So what I always say is if this framework doesn't help you, don't use it. <laughs> That's the beauty of consulting. You don't have to cram your framework down anybody's uh, throat or claim that it's some uh, objective view of an underlying reality. It's a lens to help us make sense out of the world. And I always encourage people, try on different lenses, try on different perspectives and see what they tell you about the world. Maybe it's even a perspective that you don't agree with, but maybe that perspective gives you an insight you didn't have before that you can incorporate into the strategy you're using for your own life, for your ministry, for your business, uh, et cetera. So, I'm really excited um, about how this is going. Today, I really just want to talk briefly on the cultural change point again. When I did my podcast around Eric Hoffer and outsider cultural change, I left off one example that I had wanted to talk about because it was actually a reader request. So I want to come back and address that, and it'll give me one more opportunity to come at the outsider cultural change piece from a little bit of a different angle. Maybe look at it from a center out versus outside in perspective. Somebody asked me, Aaron, what do you think of praxis? And praxis is a term that's used for lots of things these, these days. Uh, I've mentioned before praxis, the college alternative uh, boot camp, discoverpraxis.com is that company. It's a really very interesting outlet, uh, so I would encourage you to check it out uh, if you've got a child uh, who's thinking about college or coming up to that age, or you know somebody's maybe looking to do a reboot, check them out, discoverpraxis.com. Yes, I have a connection to the person who owns Praxis, so, you know, full disclosure there, but it's a very interesting one. But I'm not talking about that Praxis today. I'm talking about Praxis, the Christian Accelerator in New York City. And I believe their website is praxislabs.com. 
Uh, at least I hope that's the website that I pull up. There's so many Praxises out there that I, I can't always uh, keep them straight. But Praxis says, if you go to their website, that they are advancing redemptive entrepreneurship and that they are building a venture, excuse me, it's a venture building ecosystem with a redemptive imagination supporting founders, funders, and innovators motivated by their faith to address the major issues of our time. And they say that they have 206 ventures and there's been $100 million in capital uh, deployed to those. I don't think they directly invested $100 million, but these businesses have raised $100 million. And they have two tracks. One is a for-profit business track, similar to like a Y Combinator or something like that. And then there's a nonprofit track. And I have not gone into detail on Praxis, uh, but as it happens, I know and know of some of the people who founded it. And I am actually very positive on Praxis. Everything I've heard about Praxis is very positive. And again, some of that is more uh, about the people that I know, uh, more than uh, my detailed knowledge of the place. But, you know, I'm high on, on Praxis. So who's there? Scott Kaufman was one of their partners uh, there. Scott used to work at Redeemer, and we had a little interaction in the past there. And talked with him several times over the years. He's an ex Accenture guy who's about my age. So we have a lot in common and we think about the world in different ways. I think I just think he's very competent, uh, very good guy. There's another person that recently joined there as a partner, Sajan George. Uh, he's actually living in India. I don't know if he left India. A lot of indie people seem to be connected to Praxis. Uh, Indianapolis represent uh, here. Uh, I believe he was a turnaround consultant. Uh, for a while, and he was doing work in the ed reform space here. I've only met Sajan once, uh, but seemed like a great guy. Andy Crouch uh, is also uh, a partner there, or at least was. Uh, I've never met Andy, but I've read some of his books, and I enjoyed them. I benefited from them. And I'm going to be careful what I say here, but one of my uh, friends actually does know Andy. He's been in his house and speaks very highly of him. says, man, the guy's got a great family, great kids, kind of people you want to be around. And so uh, very positive things uh, all around. I don't know everybody there, but I think they are, you know, basically pretty solid, interesting organization. I think people assume I must not like Praxis or people like Praxis because they're very much in this neutral world, cultural engagement mode. Uh, but that's not true. I like them. And in fact, I like a lot of the neutral world stuff. In fact, I'm probably... With the exception of my inability to, you know, not call a spade a spade, which is sort of genetic, I guess, uh, you know, my cultural outlook is very much in the neutral world uh, sort of landscape. You know, I, I am much more cult comfortable in that cultural milieu probably than I am in the positive world uh, milieu. You know, I've been on, you know, NPR type programs. I'm on a public radio. I'm having good conversations with people. And it's very easy then I go on some really, really red meat, you know, conservative talk radio program, which I've been on a few, and I'm like, I don't even know how to talk here. <laughs> this is kind of a, uh, a little bit of a foreign uh, environment to me. Uh, but, you know, I'm actually kind of positive um, towards that. But here's what I want to say about that. Praxis exists at the cultural center. And people at the cultural center have a tendency to be positive towards the world and positive towards the status quo. Going back to the uh, Eric Hoffer podcast on outsider cultural change, he makes this point. Successful people tend to keep doing more of what made them successful, right? They tend to not go off and try some radical new innovation or uh, try to you know upset the apple cart, radical disruption. These are people who are successful and they're gonna keep on doing what made them successful. It's the failures and the people who weren't successful in the model who tend to be more challenging of the model, more innovative. Now, I think he understates the degree of change that often does come out of the cultural center. I think his statement of people who tend to keep doing uh, what they're doing is that made them successful is often very applicable to you know first-generation success, the nouveau riche, the arviste, uh, whereas you know, the second, third, fourth generation, you know, trust fund heirs tend to be a little bored, tend to be a little guilty, and often get involved 
in various movements of, you know, of a reformist stripe or of a change stripe. That may be a little bit less true today, but I used before the example of, you know, the settlement house movement and a lot of, uh, you know, uh, WASP women or second, third generation heirs became very, very involved in sort of various social movements, particularly early part of the 20th century. So people at the center can and do uh, change things, but by and large, I think people at the center tend to look around and think that the status quo is pretty good. Uh, I use the example of David Brooks. So David Brooks uh, writes these columns, you know, in the New York Times, and he often has a sense, I think, of worry or alarm that these forces of social conflict and disintegration sort of threaten the republic in a certain way. And I, I think about that. You can think about his recent, you know, the people trying to save evangelicalism from itself. You know, those people are those that are sort of defending the traditional ways of engagement against those who've adopted a more, you know, radicalist view, if you will. And if you're David Brooks, if you're a best-selling author, if you're rich, if you're at the New York Times, if you're in Washington, D.C., you look around and everything looks pretty good. I mean, how often does David Brooks come into contact with vast tracts of kind of blasted out landscapes and, and engage in any depths in these milieus? Now, I know he does personally get involved in many volunteer activities in the D.C. area, so he's definitely not holed up in, you know, just a rich person's compound, never getting involved with, you know, people in need. He's very much involved with that from everything that I see personally. But he's just in, you know, a world where things look pretty good. And anything that would kind of threaten the system, it's just, it's just not going to have the perception that things are bad enough to warrant extraordinarily disruptive, very risky, revolutionary moves. Whereas if you live in Youngstown, Ohio, where it is what the urban planner Alan Malik called a transfer payments economy, where basically the city subsists on basically welfare payments of one type or another, and even the people who have jobs are by and large indirectly paid by some form of welfare payment, and your whole, I mean, I've been to Youngstown. It's pretty bleak. And no surprise that people in Youngstown take a very different view of what risks are worth taking. It's very obvious why people in Chicago's Inglewood neighborhood might take a different perspective on it, on, or Philadelphia's Kensington neighborhood. The people who live there, the people who spend the majority of their lives in that kind of a milieu, have a very different perspective on the world than people who are very successful in the cultural center. And so my observation has been very successful people tend to, by and large, be positive about the world. And, you know, I've met people who are mega, mega, mega rich, uh, you know, hedge fund partners, CEOs, all those sorts of people. And, you know, some of them are, uh, you know, more change agents than others, but by and large, most of them have the view that America, to the extent that it has problems, it needs to be tweaked much more than it needs to be, you know, radically upset. Because again, the perception when you're successful is that things must be pretty good. The, the perception when you're a failure is that it must be pretty bad. And so if we look at Praxis through that lens, what we see is Praxis is an organization of the cultural center. And again, it's very easy when you're in a place like New York to say, wait a minute, I'm not part of the cultural center. I'm struggling to pay my rent on this really uh, expensive apartment. There are always hierarchies above you, right? No matter how high you go. So these guys probably aren't going to the Met Gala. Uh, but within that sort of Christian world there, these are very plugged in people. They, they either are the cool kids. They're plugged in with the very cool kids people. And, you know, they got access to money. They've got an office in Hell's Kitchen. This is an organization that exists in a cultural center. And so I went and just looked at their website this morning, and they had three businesses uh, that they featured on, on the front. And I'll, I'll just uh, listen to what they are. 
One, I, can't, I didn't write down the name of it. It's a cryptocurrency savings application. So crypto. The other one, um, I, I'm going to almost certainly pronounce uh, this woman's name wrong. So my apologies. And I'm happy to make the correction. If somebody wants to correct my pronunciation, I'll come back next week and do it. It's uh, Hydea uh, Mujid. She's the founder of HBCUVC and was a 2019 nonprofit fellow. HBCUVC's mission is to foster the development of inclusive innovation economies. So this seems to be venture capital targeted at historically black colleges and universities. And then there's one, uh, Sarah Doubledam, uh, who is from the 2019 Business Accelerator cohort. Uh, she runs Darling, which seems to be a women's lifestyle publication slash brand. It's got a digital magazine, a social platform, video content, interactive events. It's a leading voice in culture as the first magazine not to retouch women's skin or bodies, featuring over 150 celebrities and creating multimedia campaigns for brands such as Nike, Aerie, Alaska Airlines, and Expedia. So these all look very interesting, very good, the sorts of things you would say, yes, I hope that these things succeed. They're also very inside the Overton window. It's... It's crypto, uh, which is kind of becoming big. It's kind of the, the inclusion. It's the whole, uh, you know, don't objectify women's bodies that would have just come out kind of out of any minutes. These are not revolutionary. These are not people staging revolutions. These are people who are saying, how can we address problems that we see in the world or create opportunities within the world within the basic framework of society as exists? And so that's what I would guess uh, is what you see when you have organizations at the center like Praxis is that they tend to be inside the Overton window or organizations. Now, if, having said that, that's very positive. And frankly, that's what you need as your norm. If you're all sort of revolutionary, overturned, apple cart uh, type people, you're not going to have a stable society. And then the people that want to overturn the apple cart tend to be kind of unstable people themselves uh, to begin with. Uh, and so, uh, you know, you, 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 it goes back to what I said earlier in my um, immigration uh, podcast where I talked about this idea of chaos versus order, of uh, the uh, dynamic principle versus essentially the stability principle. You need to have some of both. So it's very easy to look at an organization like Praxis and say, well, you know, I'm someone who thinks we need to have much bolder, more radical change because society is fundamentally going in a more wrong direction. And you do that and you say, well, gosh, these guys just don't get it. They're no good. Instead, say, hey, it's good that I'm over here thinking we need to have these new movements. We also need people over here taking care of, you know, the basic business of society in some respects. And so a lot of these, you know, kind of cultural engagement, neutral world things, I actually think they're doing really good stuff, but we can't, we need both. We can't just have all people doing that and we can't just have all people doing revolution. And that's why you just keep coming back to the idea of spiritual gifts uh, in, the, in the Bible or the idea of, you know, parts of the body uh, being analogous to the, to the members of the church. The fact is there are different people with different gifts, different situations in which they find themselves, different inclinations, uh, but, you know, it's all necessary to create a healthy and a coherent whole. And that's not to say that you can't get out of balance and become over-favored in one versus the other. Uh, you can, uh, but you, we need all different types of people. We can't just go to, like, one note that we just keep playing over and over and over again. But I think the key here, going back to talking about Eric Hoffer and other things, is people who are at the cultural center and people who are very highly successful, again, tend to be people who are more incrementalist and who do innovation within the Overton window, within the idea that society and the structures of society shouldn't be fundamentally challenged in some way. And so I just you know, think that that's basically been my experience of a, a lot of people in New York. New York tends to attract uh, a lot of very successful people uh, or people who you know aspire to be successful soon. In fact, uh, I could do a whole other podcast on this. 
for multiple years, a former colleague of mine have been wanting to write an article about how New York has changed uh, from it used to be in the 70s and the 80s that you could go to New York kind of broke on the bus like Patti Smith and New York was where you became successful. Whereas today, New York by and large is a place that you only go after you've become successful at some level uh, in terms of, you know, maybe you've got a degree, a family connection, a job. People are not going in at the bottom without connections, without cash, without credentials and making something happen uh, by and large in the way that you heard all of these old stories about people, you know, dreaming of New York and going there. It's become a different place. It's become a, it's become a city uh, of, uh, you know, people who are already successful in some way, not just people who are in the process of becoming successful. And again, that's, that's not a hundred, it's not a hundred percent blanket statement either. I'm sure there are people who are out there saying, look, yes, I came there from nowhere in order to try to make it on Broadway. I know people do that, but and I'm just talking about tendencies that have shifted um, over time. And so uh, New York, D.C., L.A., these global cities, they come with a certain perspective, and that's the perspective of people who've been successful within the current system and therefore tend to be skeptical of ideas that would radically transform the system. Um, you know, in, in a sense. So I'm just, you know, nothing really about Praxis uh, other than to say, I like those guys. I'm very positive on everything that I've seen that they're doing. I'd love to go out and check out about more of what they're doing there, uh, but sort of just an opportunity for me to talk more about this idea of the cultural center. But I did want to take uh, that question from a reader. So yes, uh, very uh, generally positive on them to the extent that I know. And so thank you for listening, and I will talk to you again next week.